So welcome everybody. I'm Catherine Bell and I am the founder of The Awakened Company. And I am with my colleague Bliss Amy and we welcome you to today's session. We are super excited to have you with us. Um, just so everybody knows, we're in two rooms. So the panelists are in one room and the uh, participants in another. And it's because we have over 1500 people on this call. At 60 minutes, we're gonna invite you to type your Q&A in the Q&A portion of Zoom. If I could please ask to keep that Q&A quiet for the next hour so that people can remain present to what our team is communicating today. So I would like to introduce Annette Peter. Annette Peter is the president and general counsel at the Enneagram Institute. And it's such an honor and pleasure to have her with us today. So Annette, can you please pop in and just say a few words? Good morning, or I guess good afternoon. We're into the afternoon. I'm in New York uh, on New York time. Um, so thank you, Catherine. Uh, I only want to say just a few things before we get started. I don't want to take up a minute. Uh, longer than I need to so that we can get to this great program. Um, but I want to express uh, an incredible uh, sense of gratitude to everyone today. Uh, that's the feeling, the overwhelming feeling that I'm having right now. And I want to express that first to you, Catherine, for bringing us all together, um, making this happen and running the show. Um, it's so exciting. Um, of course, to Russ Hudson, um, the Hudson in, you know, uh, the Hudson, the Russ Hudson, what can I say? Um, he has such tremendous gifts and I've known Russ for several years. We've worked together. He has such knowledge, insights, experience, um, and those are just precious gifts. And every time I interact with Russ, I feel that, and I know he's going to bring it today again. So I just feel very lucky and thankful to Russ. Um, and also in my new role at the Institute, Russ has been tremendously welcoming to me and that is so appreciated. And I have a feeling I'm gonna be calling him so often, he's gonna to wanna to block my number. So I hope that doesn't happen. Uh, I hope that doesn't happen, Russ, cause I need you. But um, that's just to say that this uh, friendship, this working together collaboration um, needs to continue and needs to grow uh, for sure. Uh, and of course to, Brian Taylor, uh, uh, more gratitude. Uh, Brian is such an amazing man uh, that I work with every day. And he's been with the Institute from the very beginning. He's got tremendous knowledge and insights to share. And I'm just so happy that he's part of the program today as well. And uh, to everyone who's watching, everyone who's participating today or may watch this later uh, in the Enneagram community, we're so fortunate to have you here. Uh, we hope that what we're presenting today is helpful. We hope um, that you'll find it useful and we're grateful for you and for your time today. So with that, not a second longer, let's, uh, let's get started. <laughs> Thank you so much, Annette. And it's been awesome to work with you thus far and feel your energy and feel your um, passion for the Enneagram Institute and uh, making the world a better place. I felt that every time that we've spoken. So I really, really appreciate that about you. So thanks for joining us and thanks for saying, for, for chiming in. So, you know, for everybody, I it's really important uh, for me to acknowledge those who have walked before us. And so I'd like to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation uh, of Alberta Region 3. And I really invite everybody to just take a pause and just to thank those who have walked before us with your full heart, with our full heart. So just thank you for that. Okay, and we'll just have a brief centering practice to start. Uh, if you wanna be more receptive, place your hands up, more grounded, place your hands down on your knees, feet on the floor. <clears throat> and really this time together does represent a coming together. So I want us to bring our energy together. So let's first start with ourselves and then we'll start with our entire community. Then we'll go to our entire community. 
So first I'd like you to feel the awareness, to experience the awareness in your right arm. Bring your awareness to your right arm. Bring your awareness now to your right leg. Awareness to your right leg. Next, your awareness to your left leg. Next, awareness to your left leg. Now your left arm. Your left arm. Now I want you to place your awareness on both your legs, on both your legs. And just notice how amazing it is that we can place our consciousness in different spaces. Now place your awareness in both of your arms. Now bring your awareness to your entire body. Awareness to your entire body. Now become aware of the field that is between us and amongst us. the field that is between us and amongst us. And the field that holds us all together. We are together right now. There's nowhere else to be Nowhere else to go. We are together right now. Thank you. So with that, I would like to introduce Brian Taylor. And Brian Taylor is the vice president of the Enneagram Institute. And I would say Brian Taylor has been a rock of the Enneagram Institute. And I personally am so thankful for that, Brian, because it's changed my world. So thank you. So Brian, if you could please give us a brief description of the Ready Assessment and, and why would people wanna use it? Okay, well, thank you, Kath, and thank you for leading the, the uh, grounding meditation, and uh, thank you for putting this event together uh, with the Awaken Company and Russ and the Enneagram Institute, and I'm happy that Joey and Bliss and Amanda are joining us as well. Um, uh, I think this is an excellent follow-up to last week's session you did on COVID and the Enneagram, because um, as we're all aware, this is giving us a chance to reflect more, a little bit more about what's really important. How are we reacting to COVID? Uh, what is it impacting us? What are we afraid of? What are we grateful for? There's so much to go on for. But I'd also like to thank everyone uh, for, uh, uh, everybody who's participating today from God knows where. I mean, I, I don't think I'm gonna say good morning or good afternoon or good evening. I'll just say hello. And I think that, and hope that this will be uh, an excellent opportunity for all of us to kind of, you know, learn from each other and to share, discuss, inquire, and grow together. Um, so on that, I, I'd just like to say that uh, we're discussing the ready, the uh, Riso Hudson Enneagram type indicator today. And before we tur do turn things over to Russ, I'd just like to share a few thoughts about the ready. Uh, first of all, it is not helpful to think of it as a test. It's more of an assessment. A test is going to pretty much identify everything about yourself. And that's exactly what we don't want to do. We want you to begin a process of inquiry where you will beginning to, to discover certain qualities, certain attributes, maybe even some uh, areas for growth um, and how we get ourselves wrapped up in personality and how we need to kind of have time to reflect 
Um, so it's really, uh, I would say the ready is really intended to help us identify, you know, the issue, the uh, habitual act, uh, activities and actions, reactivities, unconscious habits that we have, and to uh, discover those and also to acknowledge and even discover many of the fine attributes that we're not aware that we have or that we think we don't have, and to see that all of this as tools for further growth. So what is the ready? The ready is 144 forced choice questions, 288 sentences that uh, gotta, are really intended to help us start thinking about who we are, what talents and gifts we have, what impediments we might have that we might not want to recognize about ourselves. Um, what it will do, um, it, it should identify what we would call your dominant personality type uh, of the nine types on the Enneagram, which are in all of us, which is the area where we are most fixated, where are we most um, noticing where uh, our issues and abilities and talents are. And so that when you look at the results of the ready, you have to look at all, actually all seven, I mean all nine types, not just the, the, um, the dominant type and the wing. Uh, so, um, and that's how we get the individuality. So you can't say that all twos are the same, all threes are the same, and it, uh, the only variant is the wing. No, it's really all, all seven qualities. So before we get, before I turn this over to Russ, I just like to give a, just about three little things to keep in mind uh, during the discussion today. And also that you might wanna keep in mind when you are doing, taking the test or going over the results. Um, so first and foremost, and this is an issue which um, a lot of individuals have misunderstood. We do get calls at the Institute where people are asking questions about how to interpret things. Uh, and that would be when you take the test, you'll come with a conclusion where you will think that the two highest scores are respectively your dominant type and your wing. So we have people calling in or saying that they took the test and they're a five with a one wing. Um, and we're just kind of scratching our heads about that. So caveat number one in looking at your scores, your two highest scores are not necessarily your dominant type and your wing, though they might be. Second, and this is also important, once you have your, determined your dominant type and wing, don't stop there. Don't just say, well, I'm a nine and you know, that's just the way I am and I can't change. Um, no, um, I just say, uh, take out your suitcase and pack your bags because you're about ready to go on a journey of finding out more about who you are and how you're gonna grow. And third and finally, I would say, you may in the process discover that you have come up with your dominant type. And then after several months or uh, reflection, you might say, I've mistyped myself. I'm, I'm not that type at all. Well, that's not uncommon, and that's actually a good thing because you can uh, begin to let go of identifications that you might have had when you took the test and that you felt had influenced uh, your answers or you were answering um, for various reasons how you wanted to be. And Russ will go into this uh, in more detail later, but it's um, I would just say acknowledge the fact that maybe you mistyped yourself, keep yourself, keep an open mind and move on. Remember that the goal of the whole Enneagram process is um, to kind of activate your journey of self-discovery and not to uh, simply develop a new substitute ego for the old one that's there now. So with that, let me turn it over to uh, back to you, Catherine, and you can introduce Russ, who I think we all know. <laughs> so, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much, Brian. <laughs> I loved what you said kind of about that Enneagram being a real vehicle for self-discovery. And, you know, I've been studying this since I was about 15 and it's still like, it's still unpacking. It's still unpacking. As I see my typos, I see my seven wing, you know, like it's, still, it's still unpacking. So, and I'm just grateful for the journey. And I think that's a really, really important, your, your points were very important, Brian. So thank you so much for that. So I'd like to, as I think almost everybody on this call knows Russ Hudson, and he's the president emeritus uh, of the Enneagram Institute and founder of Russ Hudson Consulting. And so Russ, the first question we have for you uh, is, can you please describe how the ready can be used for self-inquiry, for coaching and for in, and in consulting? That's a really a three-part question. So maybe start with the self-inquiry. Thank you, Catherine. And uh, thank you, Annette and Brian for kicking us off so beautifully. Um, and give me some good reminders of things to think about. 
Um, yeah, I think what Brian was saying is very, very important. Once the Enneagram cat was out of the bag, um, it became this stampede to know your number, know your number, get your number. And that's not really what it was originally about. Finding your number was a journey, as Brian was just saying, of learning yourself from the inside out. Really getting a deeper, intimate, contactful self-awareness that actually is very rare in the world. One of the reasons people have difficulty with tests is because they don't know themselves very well. And that doesn't mean there's something wrong with them. That's just what the world at this stage leaves us with. We have all sorts of ideas and assumptions and imprints, but to really know who I am is no small thing. It's a big thing. And we forget that. We assume that we know each other. We assume we know ourselves, but if you really embarked on that journey Brian was talking about, you're going to get some surprises along the way. And that would be a sign that you're actually learning something, right? That would be a good thing. So, you know, as, as Brian was also saying, when Don Riso and I started working on this project oh so many years ago, I think we started working on this in 1991. Our idea was not necessarily that we'd have a foolproof mousetrap, you know, to get, get your number. We hope it <laughs> the number, and it does, but it was meant as a kickstart to cultivating, activating our capacity for self-observation. And the Enneagram bottom line is learning how to observe ourselves. And all the major teachers, certainly Claudio Naranjo, certainly Oscar Ichazo, certainly Helen Palmer, certainly Don and me, all the sort of founding people in the system would totally agree. If we, we might disagree about details here and there, but we all agreed that that's what it was for. And that's what we're doing. So if you're thinking about coaching someone in this, there's so much more to it than just telling them their type and describing it to them. Yeah, you can do that. That's part of it. But that's kind of self-evident when you agree. The big part of it is develop, helping them develop that self-awareness, that capacity to observe what we're actually up to. One of the other uh, things that Don and I taught years ago was something called the strata, the nine strata. And it's relevant here. Um, uh, we, some of you who may have studied with us or with me subsequently learned this, but the idea is that as you come online, so to speak, as you get more present, more awake, and let's remember that the Enneagram is a tool to cultivate our presence and awareness. The first thing we encounter is the first layer is just we assume we know who we are. We assume we've got a handle on on, on who we are. We've maybe heard rumors about something called the subconscious and so forth, but you know, that is not the way we walk around. We assume we get, have a handle on ourselves, but every time we say certain things, everybody that knows us well starts snickering. <laughs> they start giggling or laughing because we have delusions. We don't get the picture of who we are very clearly. But if we're sincere, if we really want to know ourselves, we start to discover contradictions. We start to see places where what we think we do and what we actually do don't line up. So the second layer is you start to see what you're actually doing, not what you think you're doing. And whether we're talking about the types or whether we're talking about the instincts or the subtypes, same thing. We have a lot of assumptions that if we were to examine our life carefully, don't bear out. We do things differently than what we think. And there's some things we think we do that we maybe don't do the way we think we do them. So to just get to that level of looking at my behavior accurately, that would be a first step in a, in a powerful coaching, right? To just get people to see, well, what are you actually doing? If you can see that, You've already moved away from the pack. You've already started to discover something powerful. And the Enneagram is helping us do that by asking us questions. 
What is the ready doing but asking us a series of questions where we actually have to stop and consider, and do I do more of this or do I do that? And just saying, well, I do them both equally is kind of a cop out. It's kind of saying, I really don't wanna see what I'm up to. I'm gonna stay comfortable in how I look at myself. And that's, again, a lot of human beings sign up that way. We don't do everything equally. It's ridiculous. We don't. We absolutely are making unconscious and conscious choices all the time. And there's patterns to them. So as we're at exploring the questions that the test brings up, we're starting to look at this layer of what we actually do. And if we can look at what we actually do, we get to the third layer, which is our real motivations, our psychological issues, all the underlying stuff out of our history that's generating our, a lot of our behaviors. Now, if we even get to that second stage, we're doing somebody a big favor because not many people ever go even to that point and even fewer to the level of seeing their their dynamics, their psychology, their motivations. And then there's another layer where we actually start to bring presence to all of it. And that's when it begins to transform it. So we have to start somewhere. And I think, you know, Don and I had no illusions that the uh, an instrument, an, an assessment tool like the Ready should be the beginning and end all of somebody's Enneagram journey. We never thought that. And I don't think any of the others would be that either. It's a tool to initiate a process, to get us going, to start asking the right questions, to look at ourselves with fresh eyes. I also think for those of you who are coaches and counselors and so forth, that that's a great thing because the ready, I think, or, or any assessment tool is most powerful when the person who's taken it can discuss it and get some feedback and bounce things off someone who has had the opportunity to work with them, see them, observe them. Don used to say something I like very much. He says, we're trying, we're asking people to report on themselves based on the very capacity that we're trying to provide for them. You see, we don't have a certain kind of self-awareness when we come into this, but we're trying to develop it. And that's why the other thing Brian was saying I want to highlight is that uh, you have to allow for some new discoveries. You have to allow for the idea that you've got some things a bit off. We don't learn if we don't make mistakes. And so it's entirely possible that we mistype or we, we see it wrong or the other popular thing is interpreting, changing the whole interpretation of the type so that it fits me. People do all kinds of stuff to sort of protect the way they see themselves in that first layer. Uh, and, and we have to be, as coaches, kind and compassionate in helping people and having them look at it and come to the okayness of whatever they really are up to, you see? So um, I would just add, you know, I when I first learned the Enneagram, I, I thought I was an Enneagram four. And for a couple of years, I'd say, maybe two, two and a half years, I, I did. Now, there were a variety of reasons for that. And when Don met me, he says, you know, I'm not sure that you're a four. I don't know what the heck you are, but... I, <laughs> I don't, I don't think you're a four, and, but I am very proud to say, you know, that I changed my mind. I came to a certain realization. Oh, no, in fact, I'm a five. I'm a five with a four wing. Uh, but, I, you know, we, we ought not to have a, any kind of shame about discovering that we're something different than what we thought, because the whole point of the system is for us to discover what we are that we didn't think. So, so, you know, there, we, we want to hold people in that process. Um, the other thing I'd say, if you're going to coach or work with somebody about this, um, and this, this is a funny thing, we have this beautifully designed test online, and you can get through it a lot faster than we could in the old days, and it works beautifully and very well. But if you're really going to do this as, as some sort of coaching offering, I would also suggest you get a copy of the book, Discovering Your Personality Type. 
which has certain information about the test and how we made it and so forth, but also has handy in your hand the questions. So that you can you can go back and and you know when people you can review things you can talk about issues you can bring up some of the questions in the test you can do that on the test too but I'm just saying you know it might be handy to have have uh, the book as well but basically you want to help people go back and look at some of the decision points they made and examine them and see why they went the way they did what are they seeing about themselves uh, why did I pick this this statement instead of that one. And in, in that process, you're, you're inviting people to take a closer and closer look at what's going on in them. Often you're, we're also uncovering ways we have ideas about ourselves that are defending against seeing something about ourselves, And that's what the Enneagram's for. So, you know, the, the whole thing, if you think of coaching people with this tool as, as a way of initiating a really rich and even long-term conversation about what's going on in them, you can mine a lot of stuff from it. And there's other things I'll say about that, but that, I think that's a good place to start. And I really wanted to give everybody a sense of how I think of using this instrument. Thank you so much, Russ. We've had a lot of questions about when people get their ready results, how, how to interpret them. You know, we've had a lot of questions about that. So if you could please illuminate some, some points on that for us. Well, again, Brian gave me such a beautiful uh, you know, start here. He, he hit a lot of the key notes. Um, one thing is, you know, the test supposes that your dominant type will come out likely in the top three scores you have. It may come out as the, the highest and often does a uh, significant percentage of the time, but almost always we're, we're very high percentage. It'll be one of the top three. But I, again, in the lines of what we've been talking about, I would really recommend if you've got three different scores, they're not necessarily your type and wing. They're not necessarily your tri-type. You know, there's all kinds of different theories out there. But remember, too, that when you take the test, you're not necessarily getting who you are you're getting a, a snapshot of how you see yourself at that time. You're getting a, a picture of your self-reflection, okay? So now that means if you take the ready and you do some coaching work and exploration and you take it again, I will bet you uh, some of your scores will move because you start to learn different things about yourself. You see yourself differently. So the test, and this isn't just the ready, it's any test that depends on self-reportage. It cannot be more accurate than our self-knowledge. We do our best to trick you. <laughs> we do our best to sort of not make it obvious. And, and there were a number of things about that in, in just, for example, in each paired set of paired statements, Don and I worked very hard so that roughly half of the types would pick one or the other. If we had a question that only one type would pick that and the other eight would go the other way, that would create a distortion in the overall test. You'd get a false positive on that other one and it would skew the results. So there's so many more elements to it than what you might imagine. Um, in any case, um, interpreting the test the, the other thing I would say is that, again, as Brian was mentioning, one of the cool things about it is your results are not just what's the highest. Again, finding your type from one point of view is kind of the booby prize. Finding your type is the beginning of the journey, not the end. It gives you a launch pad to begin the, the process of integrating your psyche and, and coming home to yourself. It's, it's, a, it's a long, lifelong journey. But what you get with the ready beyond just what your dominant type is, you get kind of a map of the lay of the land for all nine points. And I find that really helpful. For example, 
you know, if I take the test and, you know, maybe my five comes up high, my four comes up high, some other type is up there, but I notice it's only got a, a three or four points in the nine, that tells me something. So if you know the Enneagram types and what they're about and what their values are, then the low scores become just as important as the high ones. What is dropped out of my life? What am I ignoring? What am I not dealing with? It's just as important as what I'm obsessing about. And, and, it's, and that's kind of, for those of you who've studied uh, Dawn and my work or, or the Enneagram in that way, it, all of, all of the, the instincts, for example, work that way. Yeah, you got your dominant instinct, but you also have a blind spot. We have blind spots, so to speak, around some of the types. But we just don't get it, don't see the use of it, and we don't allow that in our life. And a lot of coaching often is about that. So, for example, if I had no nine, I do not know how to chill out. I do not know how to relax. I don't know how to take it easy. I don't know how to just sit in myself and restore my groundedness. That's a big deal. If I don't have any seven, you know, I'm, I'm all work and no play makes Jack a dull boy. You know, I, I'm, I'm kind of, you know, I, I need adventure. I need new experiences. So actually the, the thing, the types you don't have high offer certain prescriptions, which become very helpful for coaching. And, and then you get to creatively see how that's working with what's dominant in the person, because we really are much more fingerprint in terms of how we sit in all these types than just here's your type here's the description it, and it, it's it suits your narcissistic needs have a nice day you know that's that uh, there's not much that comes from that but beginning to look at the whole pattern of what you're over determining under determining maybe what's okay in your life then you've got something you can work with so, you know, beyond that, you can, you can go over with somebody, as I said, the, the particular questions and ask them why they went this way or that way. Again, if you get away from the idea that we're just winning the gold scar, star of, uh, of finding our, our Enneagram type, uh, if, if you can get over that, you what you're really doing is helping the person know themselves and better dance with life and manage the different internal and external resources of their life. Um, there, there's probably more I could say about it. Only, oh, another thing I'd say about it. I found you can also apply this to groups and teams, which is a really cool thing. Uh, and this, this actually led to uh, some work that Don and, a, and a, a team that he was working with did around working in organizations um, with this idea of the nine domains. But I used to go into organizations and often I'd be asked to work with a team. I'd have everybody on the team take the ready. But what I did is not, oh, well, Freddie over there is a three, so he's going to do this. And, 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 and uh, Susan over there is an eight, and she's going to do that. And there's there's uh, Mike and he's a one and he's going to do this. No, that's not what I did. Uh, they already know that <laughs> for one thing. Uh, it just confirms uh, ideas that they, we have about each other. What I did is I take, have everybody take the test. Then I make a composite. I'd add all the, the test scores together and divide by the number of people on the team. And it would make a ready chart for the team. And then we know, okay, the team has a lot of three and eight. So this is a real go-getter team, but oh my goodness, look at this. There's no five and there's no four and there's no nine. So there's no vision of long-term things. They're, we're charging out, but we, we're not thinking ahead or planning or, you know, and so on. So it became a way of opening up and, and creating creative discussions for a team about how they can better cooperate and work together. So that's another way, you know, it, it's a wonderful tool. Once you know how to work with the, the, the different numbers, and once you kind of understand how the types represent something more than just being a type of person, they're all a part of you and me, and they're part of any human activity we do, 
you can really uh, extract a lot of information out of this test, out of this assessment. Thank you so much, Russ. I know when I looked at a thousand leaders, less than 6% fell in the four and the five. So yeah. it was like an invitation to become more of the four and the five. And knowing that provided real insight. Yes, so and, and exactly. And, and it's not necessarily the team is going to hire a four or a five, might, but probably not. It's more like, what does that represent for our team and its mission? What does that look like? That's already a really interesting conversation on a team. What does five represent on this team? How could we bring more of that perspective into what we're doing since we're clearly missing the significance of that? So, you know, that was the way Don and I worked a lot with it. And, and just to sort of open up our minds, you know, this is another purpose of that already, I think, too, was to get people out of this thing that it's just about finding your number and then blabbing about your personality. I don't think that's going to transform much of anything in this world. But to generate creative conversations and explorations, yes, I'm, I'm down with that. And you don't have to be in, in a, you know, a, a spiritual school to begin that process. It helps, but you don't have to. <laughs> well, it's, it's so interesting. So yesterday I was presenting to a university and they asked me, how did I get involved in mindfulness meditation? And I said, the Enneagram. Like, isn't that interesting? It's a real window into different, to an exploration of our spiritual nature. Um, and you know, Russ, I love to color outside the lines and you've spoken about creativity. So how can the ready be used creatively? Like, how can we use it to to kind of expand our perspectives? Well, you know, I would say, Catherine, some of the things I was already talking about by looking at ourselves in a more global way. You know, I'm famous for my kind of glib, smart alecky comment I made years ago, but it's accurate, is that the Enneagram doesn't put you in a box. It shows you the box you're already in without realizing it and how to get out of it. Well, creativity is nothing if it's not discovering what we are outside of the box, plugging into our real core and, and how we express who and what we are more fully using whatever talents we have in the world. You know, I don't think of creativity as just, you know, painting or acting or music or something. The, the arts are amazing. I love them. And I, I personally wouldn't want to live without a life rich in arts. However, there are people who are creative in a kitchen. There are people creative at business. There are people creative at law. There are people creative at all kinds of endeavors. But the antithesis of creativity is habit. When we're just running ourselves habitually, which is what we do when we're identified with our type, we just keep doing the same old thing. And you could even be an artist and do that and kind of feel like, my creativity's kind of dried up. What's, what's going on here? So I think my, for me, the Enneagram was always a tool to help us discover what we are beyond our patterned personalities. We don't learn our type to just be that. It's to see it with kindness, even affection and, and a presence the Enneagram has always been about presence so that there's some space from it. And in that space, well, that's the space through which creativity and creative ideas and creative impulses come to us. So, you know, as a five, you know, there's certain things I'm going to do just like falling off a log, but I, I had to learn little things like, you know, if I cut myself off from human interaction and contact, my creativity dries up. I become just this habitual, isolated guy with this head full of this, that, and the other thing. But in, it's always, the Enneagram is always showing us something a little counterintuitive. That what we need to do is probably what we don't feel like doing. But when we do it, suddenly things open up for us. And so the ready is just a, a marvelous way of, of showing us the assumptions we have about ourselves. And as I said, starting to reveal the behaviors that we actually are doing and maybe doing very repetitiously. And as we see that, 
as we start it. And especially if we have somebody to work with on this, a peer or a coach or whatever, and to talk about it, that in itself, I think, opens up all kinds of new creative channels. Things get juicy again. Things get interesting again. And you start to find resources in yourself that you had forgotten you had. So that, that's another way. It's kind of hard sometimes, you know, ready. We just thought of it as, as I said, a way of getting people into the real process of what the Enneagram's about, what it's for. And, and in that, I think it's going to make us more creative. I doubt that um, Don and I would have um, accomplished what we did if we didn't have some insights into how we got stuck. I, I can tell you, you know, uh, Don used to tell the story often of as a four, he would get, he really had to use, he knew the Enneagram well enough and he knew he needed his one and he knew he needed discipline and structure, even though he didn't feel like it. He, if he didn't do that, he wouldn't, his books would never have been written. And so he committed to certain disciplines through which he, he was able to get outside of the box of his foreignness and, and bring into the world what he did. Another thing he did was that he, he didn't always feel like it, but he was a runner. And he knew in some sense in his foreignness, he'd get out of touch with his body. So he'd commit to running a certain time, number of times a week. And in doing that, he was helping himself get out of the box. So this ties together really all the questions we've asked, but, but it's how the insights that you extract from the test. And that can, again, can be as much from what is low as it is from what's high in the test. It starts to give us ideas of how to get out of our own box. So, so true, Russ. So what would you suggest the implications of the ready are for personal development and spiritual growth. And I'm meaning in a real life way and maybe walk around the different types for us. Like it's all about being in the world. We're in the world, you know, being in the world. Well, I think that, you know, that part of it, really that, that question is pertaining to the study of the, the whole Enneagram in general, because that's what it's for. The Enneagram is for that. But I think the Enneagram it is illuminated by, you know, looking at your test scores, your, your assessment numbers. As you start to look at this, like if I was going to begin, you know, studying this, I would always tell people you need a practice. And it doesn't matter. You know, it's just something that gets you centered, grounded, more connected to your body, heart and mind and that you'll do. <laughs> As one of my mentors used to say, the key thing about practices is to do them. She also used to say, if you don't do the practices, you lose all right to complain about any of this because you're full of it, right? So you need to practice. And what you look at, the, the second part is, you have a way to take your practice into life and be aware of what you're up to in life. What triggers you? What shuts you down? What turns you into a raving lunatic? What makes you regress to a two-year-old, etc.? And that is, as you cultivate from your practice more and more capacity to look at yourself objectively and kindly, you, you actually take it out on the road. You take it into life, you take it into your walk, you take it into your tennis game, you take it into your office, whatever. That's what you do. And that is where the Enneagram comes in. You know, you start to, and, and the test or the, 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 I can just call it the ready. The ready and, and the study of the Enneagram is really most helpful for that. It helps us see, as I used to say, most people can agree with, you know, various spiritual punchlines, like it's very good to be kind. I think most people will say, yeah, sure. It's very good. Be here now. Yes, I want to be here now. But the fact of the matter is 99% of the time we're doing neither of those. So what are we up to and why? That's where the Enneagram comes in. And that's how it supports our spiritual journey. It was designed uh, actually originally for people who were 
living lives in contemplation. They were, um, you know, people in religious life, people who were praying and meditating. And it, it began as people studying what distracted them from being in a more ongoing and integrated spiritual awareness. So your type in that view wasn't the final say of what you are. What you are, who knows, is a mystery. It's something profound, we, you know. But there is a, a way that we're formatted to operate in this world. And that formatting is more where you're gonna see your Enneagram type. So it, in that second component of just seeing what we're up to in our life, taking our meditation and our spiritual life into our life, requires being aware of what we're doing and what we're thinking and our emotional reactions to things. And that's a lifelong journey it goes on the rest of our life. The, the third component, which I think is relevant for ready and looking at the scores and so forth is we need community. Nobody can do this on their own. No one. It's completely delusional. Gurdjieff used to say, and I'm quoted on this one a lot too. He used to say, it is not difficult to do the work on your own. It is impossible. So if you don't have any feedback, you don't have anybody there being present with you, you don't have anybody to talk with about what's going on, you can get into really weird places very fast. And the journey, because we're opening ourselves up to these deeper layers of ourselves, we can get crazy cakes like that. So if we don't have the support of community and friends and people who see us and get us and can speak truth with us and we to them, you know, it's, 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 it's like trying to climb a mountain by yourself. I wouldn't recommend it. I'm just going to go up to Mount Everest by myself. Mm, I don't think you should do that. <laughs> but you put those three together, community, practice in life and, and, grounding practice, you've got a fighting chance to actually transform your life. And our, we write the books and we write and we created this instrument from the point of view of trying to give people a, a kickstart and a, a launch into that lifelong journey. And then you learn all kinds of things along the way and you, you can be fed by a lot of different sources. But to, to actually begin that process, it, it's, it, it has to begin with seeing what we're up to, what the, the self that we don't know. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Russ. The self that we don't know, that's so true. So true. So Russ, how have you seen the Enneagram change and impact people's lives for the better? How have you seen um, you really changed lives as a result of the ready and as a result of the Enneagram and walking the path. That's a really good question. Um, I think, you know, one thing that's one of my great joys is when I hear from students and I find out the wonderful new things they're doing, how they're creating more meaningful lives for themselves, how they're working through challenges and difficulties how they're held in some sort of graciousness when they're having, you know, health or relationship crises, as we all will, uh, you know, just to, to every now and then, you know, in my position, I tend to hear mostly people's problems, <laughs> but sometimes, you know, students write to me, says, this is so awesome. What's happening now. And this is going on for me and that's going on for me. And, or that, you know, I went through this really tough time. And because of that, you know, I, I was able to get through it. You know, I, I work uh, with, some of you may know about, I work with the Enneagram Prison Project and I worked with incarcerated men and women and seen enormous changes in them in the time we've been working with them. I think, you know, if I look back at uh, going back, bringing it all back home, uh, you know, I, I saw in myself and in Don Riso huge changes over our life. It isn't necessarily that you, your difficult problems or neurotic tendencies, one day they're just gone forever. 
that happens sometimes, but you can't count on it. It's more that when you get triggered and life will trigger us inevitably at some point, your recovery time is greatly reduced. You can bounce back. You, you, know, your, you know the ladders <laughs> in your own soul that lead up and lead down. And you, you can just see, ah, that's, that's that old issue of mine coming up again. Oh, that's, that's my fiveness getting triggered. That's my eightness getting triggered. That's my threeness getting triggered, whatever. You, you just see it, you take a breath and you know how to rebalance yourself a lot quicker. So instead of, you know, days, weeks, months, years of misery, you just maybe have a couple hours where you're struggling, but you know how to restore yourself. So that is, I definitely see. Um, and, and, and I say this with um, a certain delicacy. You start to find out that the spiritual rumors you have read or heard are true, but you find them out in the realm of your own experience. And my sense is as we start to retire and relax these Enneagram patterns that have been living our life for us and that the, the ready is pointing to like, hey, you might wanna notice this pattern. Um, a more profoundly satisfying, fulfilling, conscious and compassionate life is waiting for us and is here in some sense right now when we can see through our conditioning and our patterns, that's the nature of what a human being actually is. And so then there's a process of learning to trust that and learning to have that be more what decides things for me, how I live my life, how I operate my business. So that we start to be human beings, not only of that you know, occasional beautiful experiences, but we're living a life of integrity, meaning integrity with what we know to be the, the deeper truth. And again, you gotta start somewhere. And, and it's not, the other thing I'd say about that is that we don't need to produce those states. This is a, a weird thing I see a lot of spiritual teachers do. They're trying to produce far out states in students. You don't need to do that. You just need to relax what you're caught up in. You just need to be present and kind toward what, how you're stuck. And very naturally, the, the forces of consciousness of grace start working on us. That's my experience. You know, other people may have other experience, but after doing this for so many decades, that's, that's what I could say about the, the spiritual part of it. And, you know, I was thinking the other day, I said, you know how to take the ready again? Because I'd, I'd imagine my scores would be a little different than they were in 1993, uh, because I'm kind of different. And some, some things are just the same and some things are quite different just like any of us, yeah, be fun to see what it is. And, and from that, just that moment of, of clarity, ah, that's my pattern, that's what I'm up to. That's how I'm manifesting now. That's the very thing to go back to what you're saying before that opens up the portal to something beyond it. If you don't see what you're in, there's no way you're gonna get out of it. Yeah. I know uh, for me during this time, Russ, there's been a certain holding that I have never experienced before. So I have to, you know, thank COVID for that because I don't know that I ever would have experienced it had we not had this particular situation. Oh yeah. I think a lot of people are saying that. I, I'm saying, you know, one thing the Enneagram teaches me is that we can't decide whether or not we'll have difficulties or crises in our life, it is 100% certain that we will. At some point, we have a tough time. Everybody does. We go through losses. We go through crises. We go through challenges in our relationship, our work, our health. It, it just, that's life. When you know your, how to get out of your box, when you see your box 
and you have some tools for arriving in what you are beyond that, recognizing it. You have tools to navigate those difficult times with much more holding, as you said, Catherine, it, you feel held through those times and grace. I, I was, I had, as many of you may know, I had a, a heart emergency last year. I was in Paris uh, getting ready to teach and in the middle of the night, uh, my ticker started to go wrong and I was, I, I had all the symptoms, went to the hospital and I spent, you know, like 10 hours in the emergency room on a gurney with all sorts of, you know, IVs and wires. And, you know, I, I, it looked like Frankenstein. You know, I couldn't move in massive physical pain. And what I knew is my beliefs in that moment meant nothing. If all you got is beliefs, you're dead in the water. Spirituality isn't about beliefs. It's about what you know in your experience. And after many, many, many years of doing this kind of practice and work, I was able to just land in myself, even though I was in pain, even though it was you know, possible I was gonna die in the next couple of hours. But there was a graciousness. I knew how to open to that deeper dimension. The pain was still there. The difficulties were still there, but there was something bigger than all that that was there in the core of my experience. So I'm telling people that by learning to live in what we are outside the box day by day, even as our goofy personalities continue to do whatever the heck they do, that something else grows in us. And that is the part of us that you could say the spiritual self, the soul, whatever, that can be held and gracious and hold the line through those tough times. And I agree this, this epidemic that the whole world is going through now is an opportunity if we use it that way to find this deeper ground doesn't mean it's going to make the journey easy. No one promises that, but that we will have something else under our belt that helps us deal with these challenges with dignity, intelligence, and heartfulness. Thank you so much, Russ. So uh, I'm going to call on Bliss Amy now, who, speaking of ground, he's been a source of ground for me for many, many years. So Bliss, if you wouldn't mind asking uh, the first question. We have two pre-submitted questions. So Bliss will ask the first, I'll ask the second, and then I'll go to the Q&A. So thank okay. you. Absolutely, thanks, Kath. Um, this one is uh, from uh, Tiza, I think, if I pronounce that right, um, who's a coaching consultant and, and uses many assessments to support her work with executives. Um, but she'd be interested in learning more about how to help clients focus on importance, not only of their specific type, but the importance of the wings and movement for growth. Um, she's <clears throat> found it complex and, and the beauty of the Enneagram uh, to create some resistance to having to learn all of these types. Uh, for her, the biggest challenge is to help people see that this is not a tool that you can learn quickly, but is a journey into personal change and transformation. Um, what would you say, I guess, more to the statement on that, Russ? Yeah, I, I, really good question. Uh, thanks, Bliss. Um, one thing I, I think is if I am particularly working in business settings, work settings, most people aren't interested in and don't need to learn the whole complex system. What they want is the elements of it that are pertain to the situation that they're struggling with, what they're trying to work on, what they're trying to develop. Um, so, you know, um, that's where I, as the coach or the facilitator or the consultant, I need to know my stuff deeply. I need to know it so well that I can talk about it without just um, relying on jargon because they they're not jargon you know for you know people in the trenches that's kind of a turnoff and and it makes people feel like outsiders right that's that's not helpful 
So I need to be able to know it in such a way I can talk about it in everyday terms. So, you know, I've, I've given holy hell <laughs> to some people in my classes when they say, well, I'm doing it in business, so I don't really need to learn all this stuff. No, friend, you need to learn it three times more, not less. You need to be so masterful at this that you can use all kinds of different metaphors or extract particular pieces to provide for your client. You, you need to, to be so comfortable with it that you, you're kind of living in it, um, not less. I mean, we're messing around with people's livelihoods. Uh, it's not superficial. It's not a quickie. I think that's one of the personality structures of our time that's kind of pathological, actually. Hey, these are the organizations running the world. We don't need to really know ourselves or do this. Let's just give them the most superficial version. No, they don't need to know the whole the whole system, but they do need to know the part that is important for them. So vis-a-vis -vis that, if you figure out your client and what their wing is, you know, so forth, you're talking about that in human terms. If you're talking about the inner lines, you're talking about them as growth opportunities. The inner lines are both shadows. They're what we don't like to see about ourselves. You know, most, uh, uh, you know, I don't know, most uh, nines or, you know, and three and six, right? We don't like the other two. Like, I don't want to, if I'm a six, I don't want to be a narcissistic person. So that it blocks out the three energy and I don't want to be just hanging out that the nine energy, but actually both of those represent something I need. As a six, I need to chill out. <laughs> I need to get grounded. That helps me when my mind is going. I, as a, I need the three of the valuing of myself and my life and the, the preciousness of what I'm offering, what, how amazing it is that I have the talents and skills I have. So, you know, I'm, I'm talking with people about it. If I'm coaching people, I'm not necessarily talking about the jargon and the numbers and all that. I'm using it to talk with them in a human way about things that open up the journey for them. So that, that's the, the main thing I'd say is that, of course, your client doesn't want to know all this stuff. If they do, then great, you teach it to them. But many people don't, and, and they don't need to. They just need to know the part that will help them in their journey. Yeah. Thank you, Russ. So the next question is from Michelle Cooper. And here is her question. I recently did my ready and scored equally on the eight and the two a bit of an identity crisis as I had taken the ready course about 20 years ago and self-identified as a three all of those years. How can I best interpret that result? In listening to the points and reading the daily Enneagram items, I certainly see my eight and people see me as very relationship and heart focused. Russ, I would love to hear your thoughts. Well, of course, I don't know what your core point is, so I can't comment about that. Um, but I just say, even if the ready, it, it, remember what I said, it shows us how we're seeing ourselves at a given time. So we could, what we can construe is that since that time where you first took it, you were in a certain modality, a certain way of being at that time that was looking pretty three to you. Now there's something about energy, directness, leadership, empowerment, that's come up into your psyche. And the two, as you pointed out yourself, your interpersonal connectedness, kindness, all of that, that's really up for you. So it's just telling you that these are themes emergent in your life now. Now, are one of them your core point? Well, that's where we'd sit down and work with somebody and talk and explore it. And, and we'd probably land. That's probably one of those three types, right? Um, and you know, as I said, over time, I'll just address these questions because I know they come up all the time. Over time, our scores will tend to change. If we take the ready, you know, six months from now, uh, we'll get a little bit different lay of the land. But our dominant type tends to stay high, not always number one, but it tends to stay high through time while the others can fluctuate more. That's one clue. The other thing is that 
a lot of times people will get kind of flat scores. I don't mean they had one or two the same. It's like they're all about the same, like six or seven types. Almost certainly every time I've seen that, the person who has that is on the triangle of the Enneagram, meaning there are three, a six or a nine. More often, a six or a nine. And that's because of the way sixes and nines approach the whole process of taking an assessment and thinking about themselves, both from the point of view that they, those types have strong introjects, but also from the point of view, six, I, it comes out that way because they overthink it. I had, you know, I had a, I had a person years ago taking the test when I was, you know, evaluating the test, I'd give the tests out during the workshops that Don and I were teaching. And then I collect them and look at them. And, but people would, I learned about problems people had taking it. And I had a lady and she was sitting there and, and she came to the conclusion she was a six, but she was saying, I'm having so much trouble. I can't decide. I, you know, I said, well, do take the, do the easy ones first and come back to the hard ones, just like they teach you to do at school. So she did that. And I'm coming back a little later. She goes, I'm still stuck. I can't, I don't know how to answer this one, Russ. I don't know how to answer this. So I look over at the test and it is, I have tended to be decisive. I have tended to have trouble making decisions. And so I'm just looking at her and you know, her very sickness was creating all this overthinking and confusion about the test. She didn't want to make a mistake. You know, and, and so I said, mm, it seems to me you're having a little trouble making a decision about this. She goes, oh, yeah, I knew that. And she put it in and, and she, in fact, did come out of six. But it's, the six is like overthinking it. Uh, the nine is just is the nine is like the, the nineness is when I'm in the nineness is like I'm everywhere and nowhere in particular. Yeah, I'm kind of like that. Yeah, I'm kind of like that. Oh, sure, I can relate to that. What does it matter? Ha ha ha. You know, it, it's just like, but suddenly, you, you, you know, that very flat score is an indication that you kind of approach the test from a nine perspective. I'm not saying other types might not do that. But if I see those patterns, I check nine and six first, and maybe three is a runner up. It's like, you know, people always ask that question. So I'm giving it to you. <laughs> Thanks, Russ. Okay, Bliss, next question. Um, it, it may be specific in general, maybe, Russ. One is, uh, and it's about uh, the Enneagram with children or teens. And, um, you know, part of it is, you know, that it doesn't, that our types or our, our styles don't emerge until early in adulthood. Can you talk a little bit about, I think, that whole area of when's it appropriate to use the ready? What could it be used for? Children, teens, development, that sort of thing. Yeah. Well, um, most Enneagram teachers nowadays see type as temperament, meaning it's there from the beginning. Uh, and I've used the example that, you know, moms out there who've had more than one child will report that even in the womb, they could feel the children as having a certain quality energy and they are different from each other. The, the different kids. And when they come out, they don't change. Some of them are in there, cha, 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 and, 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 you know, making mixed drinks and having a party and they come out, they don't change. And others are in there just like, Oh, this is good. I don't, I'm not sure I really want to come out of here and they don't change either. So, you know, that is there from the beginning. And a lot of the issues that get sort of structured in early childhood in, you know, infancy, toddler years, uh, and so forth. And if you study developmental psychology, you learn about the different phases of ego development. And then in, you know, the main part of childhood, say grade school years, you go through what psychologists call a latency period where you get a break from your psychological issues for a few years so you can be a kid, right? But they return in adolescence. Now, I would say that the personality patterns are already there in childhood. But I would also say I, I'm cautious about teaching this stuff to kids. There are elements of it that they could find useful. And it also depends largely on the child's interest level in it. If a child's interested, I'll talk with them about it. But I, don't, I would never say, kid, you need to learn about this. 
I use it more with young people right on up through adolescents and teenagers, not for ego reduction work. I'm not there trying to help them see the, just their S's, but I am using it to help mirror to them their good qualities, their talents, help them see how they're like some of their heroes. Like I, I can tell you being a weirdo five that if I had known as a child that some of my favorite people in the world were actually had similar issues and talents as me, I'd have liked myself so much better. And so much about we're using it with young people to help them love who they are and honor who they are. They don't need ego reduction yet. They haven't fully formed their ego. So you don't want to mess with that process, but you want to help them see the good in them. And I think when we use it that way, it can be very helpful. I, I remember I had a, a little child who's a young man who's an eight, clearly so. And he was, you know, six, seven years old. And he um, didn't have a dad at the time. And for a little period of time, I functioned as kind of a male figure for him. But just knowing that he was an eight led me to be able to interact with him a certain way and made it safe for him in his eightness. And I mirrored to him how great his qualities were. And I, it was fun because I got to run into him as an adult in the last couple of years and he's turned into an amazing young man. And he acknowledged, he remembers, says, I remember you, you were really cool with me. So I'm just saying, we, it, it's as much a help for us as knowing how to be with kids as it is for something to, that they need to learn about or, you know, you understand what I mean? It clarifies a relationship with the child and it helps us help them see what's awesome about them. That's what I would say. Thank you, uh, Russ. And, you know, uh, John's a five and he recently chose himself to kind of discover uh, his type and he used the ready through to do that. Uh, oh, great. Yeah, so it was really, it was very interesting to talk about it with him. So yeah. we have a question from, so go ahead, do you wanna- I, I just say vis-a-vis uh, -vis the ready, you know, it, that goes down to what I'm saying. I wouldn't give a little kid the ready necessarily, but teenager, if they're interested, sure. And it might, it could, it would lead to some really interesting conversations again about their self-knowledge and valuing who they are. So, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you. So Marin McHugh uh, has a question. Hi, Marin. Is it possible for someone to have all wounds from all nine types that still need to be worked through like samskaras, one wound after another that when heal, healed leads to the next layer and wounding? until eventually one's, one lands in integration and wholeness with the ability to flow through each type with ease and choice? Yeah, I mean, it, the short answer is it's kind of like that. Um, when we can get out of the confines of our own fixated pattern, we'll start to encounter both the helpful energies, qualities of each of the nine points, but also the issues. I have no direct line to two, for example, on the Enneagram. However, um, I can see some of the issues of two, as, but I had to get out of my fiveness to some degree to be able to see that. I can see my, where I get codependent, where I get needy, where I tolerate bad behavior in order to keep a relationship going, all that stuff. Uh, but I also can see and start to recognize the holding and the, the loving and the heart connection qualities of two that actually help me be a better teacher, and a, a better person. Um, so, you know, but it, as you break out of the box, it, it, it's not necessarily in some pre-described sequence, but the various major issues or challenges that you have, places where you get stuck, will begin to present themselves. One thing I tell my students all the time, we have breakthroughs and we think, oh my God, I'm there. I'm enlightened now. I'm in the light. I'm in the love. This is awesome. And we think we're done. No, because love will always move toward the next boo-boo. And we're all a lot crazier than we think we are. 
And so as that light and love, it, which is real, gets liberated in us, because it's love and because it's kindness and compassion, it goes right to the next point of suffering and then works on resolving that. And, and we're all kind of unique in what they come out, but the more you know the way these operate and the war, way they're connected with our deeper essential qualities, you might say, the more graciously and expeditiously you can move through these processes. But, you know, the, the spiritual world is full, full, full of people who have some initial breakthrough and then lose their minds because they don't understand they're not done yet. They're far from done. Realizing your nature outside of the box, as I keep saying, and as Brian said at the beginning, is the beginning of the journey, not the end. You, you're a baby in the work. If I had a dollar for everybody I'd met who's had this experience and think they're masters, they're babies in the work. They don't get it yet. But it is, as you said, there's a long journey of integrating and dealing with this. And then you don't get these kind of gurus who are preying on their students and stuff like that. Thanks. Thanks, Russ. Okay, Bliss, over to you for the next question. Um I think I've lost it here, but I, the, the general gist of it, Russ, is, um, you know, where do we start? Um, someone's taken the ready and, and maybe if, if it's just me, what do I do? Or if I'm a coach and want to help them and we've got these results, they may be all the same. They may, you know, the, they, the, the, uh, the type uh, numbers may be all different, but where do I start to help myself and others um, once I've done this? Okay. Uh, well, for myself, um, it, they're a little different. If it's myself, I, like I said, I need to have a practice. Maybe I already do, but it's, it's bringing the awareness that we cultivate in practice to bear on the patterns. And the ready is going to help me see some of the key patterns that operate in me, as well as the elements of me that tend to drop out or that I reject or or suppress and to begin to see those patterns in life. Every time we are present and kind toward the manifestation of one of these psychological patterns, it creates a kind of alchemy. And in a way we digest that structure. It's like we absorb it and it, it, and it liberates the energy that was held inside it. Like the patterns are made out of you know, human energies, human forms of consciousness, but they're stuck in a pattern. As you see the pattern and hold it in kindness and awareness and all the contemplative traditions talk about this. It's, it's and to put it in kind of Western religious terms, it's like, it's like offering it up to grace. And in that process, great, by some magic, by some grace, it is transformed in us and becomes a usable energy. So that, that's just an ongoing process. And the more we know our patterns, the more we learn how to spot them in real time. And then the work begins. And I would also say, if you can find some people to work with, uh, a group, or even you know, it can be just two or three people, but people you trust who know how to show up, know how to be present, know how to talk about these things, you're on your way. If you're coaching about this stuff, I would also say you really need to know your stuff. If I'm going to presume to tell you about your Enneagram journey, I better have taken it. I better be on it. Uh, I never think of any of us. I certainly don't think of myself as an end product. I think of myself as an older brother. You know, I think of someone who's been a further along the path up that mountain. And I can tell you, you know, you get to that part there, watch out, it gets a little slippery and there's some boulders here. And then you're pretty smooth sailing for a bit. I can tell you that kind of stuff. But it's, if you're going to coach, do your own work. Know the Enneagram from the inside out. Know the ready very well. Know what it means to have these different elements in play have life experience that you can share with your client because it's not it's not just knowing some terms and frameworks that actually 
is going to be the way we're going to support people with this material. It's inviting us into a much deeper and real layer of human connection and communication. And so if we can do that, that our client is going to respond to that. We, it's just like little kids. Little kids don't learn from what their parents say. They learn from what their parents are. Right. Well, everything I think about my mom and dad, all their real good qualities went into me. Half the things they said, I just, that's nonsense. I'm not going to believe that. Right. <laughs> and you remember what it's like to be a kid and a teenager. And yeah, yeah, yeah. But when your parents are communicating to you from something real in them, you always know it. And that's the stuff you took into your heart and soul from them. That's the same when you're a coach. So I'd say that. Okay, so probably our last question for us, and that's from Mark. What do the inner lines of the Enneagram mean? And I just, before you answer that, I'll repeat the question. We have so many questions that I just want to say thank you and stay tuned because we'll see what develops from this. But I see it, there's a ton of questions, Russ, and I'm getting, there's just a ton of questions. So Russ, inner lines, what do they mean? Big topic. I'll see what I can say about it in a few moments. Uh, you know, I could do a whole workshop just on that, and I have. <laughs> um, you know, <clears throat> there was a long exploration about this, and it's evolved over time. You know, when when Don was first exposed to this material in Jesuit circles, the idea was that there was a good direction and a bad direction. But as it turned out, as we looked at it longer, it became clear it doesn't work that way. Uh, Jesuits essentially were trying to use the arrows to account for vertical movement. And so when Don brought forward the levels of development, that handled the, the vertical part of it. The arrows were something else. Um, the arrows are represent elements of me, elements of my consciousness that are kind of magic keys because they tend to be, as I said, shadow. They're, they're things I don't, that aren't part of my self-concept that I do a lot or that I traffic in a lot. So, you know, if, as a five, you know, I, there's a lot of seven in me. There's a lot of eight in me. If you're uh, an eight, there's a lot of five in you. There's a lot of two in you. However, we don't quite see accurately those parts of us. If I'm an eight and I'm thinking I'm all independent and, you know, I'm my own person and I'm not dependent on anyone except I'm a sentimental wreck with, up around the people I love and I get possessive about them and I have all these kind of two issues that I find icky, but there they are, right? And if I'm honest, I start to see they go, oh boy, there it is. There it is, you know, uh, I, I, if I'm a, you know, a one, you know, I, 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 I don't like to think that I'm like those sevens all over the place, just doing whatever they want. I'm a responsible person, but boy, do I want to run away to the circus and, and get free from all this responsibility and just go a little crazy for a while. And, and if you can own the shadow parts of these, if you can see how you're acting out behaviors from those two directions and you do them in different circumstances, but I don't have time to explain all that today. Uh, when and where and how you do that, that becomes the movement to bringing in the healthier side of those things. And so if you look at one of the, what I call the direction of integration, uh, Don called it the direction of integration, but that particular direction, for me, it's eight, five to eight. For a two, it's four. For a one, it's seven. For a nine, it's, it's three. It's like we find it distasteful until we get what it actually represents. And then it's, it's the way out. There is no healthy nine that has not integrated a healthy three. There is no healthy eight without a healthy two. There is no healthy four without a healthy one. It's sort of a, it's, it's sort of a, a deal of as these energies are integrated, there's less reason to hide out from ourselves. There's less reason to avoid parts of our experience. There's less reasons to shut down in our particular box. So it's in owning these shadow issues 
we start to become more whole. And in that journey of wholeness, we become the healthier versions of our type too. So that's how I think of it. And there's a lot more specifics to it than that, but that's the overall sense of how I work with the arrows. I, some people say they don't even exist. I, I cannot believe they're really studying the Enneagram very closely to say such things, but, but I find them hugely helpful. And going back to coaching, a lot of coaching with the Enneagram is helping people see these developmental tracks. How can we uh, engage a, a certain developmental journey? And it's different depending on what our type is. It, it, that can actually help you find your type too. I had a friend, he couldn't decide whether it's a three or a four. And he got feedback that he was a four. And I said, uh, no, I don't think so. <laughs> and he said, why? I said, well, are you all over the place with your emotions? And you, you, you just got to kind of feel like it to do it. And do you need to cultivate in you a kind of discipline and integrity to sort of balance out your emotionality? Well, that would be the four path. Or is it that you work very well and you can get a lot done and you do get a lot done, but you're trying to find a deeper purpose and a way to plug into something that's bigger than just your self-interest? Is that your journey? And he said, okay, you got me. You know, this is clearly was a three, but it was in understanding his journey that it made sense to him. It wasn't just describing traits to him. You see, that's where, again, where the Enneagram is useful. It helps us see a, a path for us. And that, and the ready can do that both from seeing our dominant type, but also seeing other areas that might need our loving attention. Thank you so much, Russ. That was uh, amazing, totally amazing. And this, you know, isn't this technology amazing? Here we are, we're all in different spots all around the world and we're together. Like that's amazing, truly amazing. So I wanna thank, first of all, everyone who's listened, everyone who's participated, everyone who's been here with us. And, and Russ, thank you. Brian, thank you. Annette, thank you. Joey, thank you. Amanda, thank you. Bliss, thank you. So love to everybody. And just my heart is filled with gratitude for all of you. So thank you. Bye for now, everybody.